where my, my focus is really on uh, working with the Peace Tech Laboratory uh, on the leadership and, and strategic planning side. So that's my, my background. On my right, we're fortunate enough to have Her Royal Highness Princess Sarah of Jordan. And I'm afraid I'm going to read this in case I miss some, some pearls out about what people have done. Um, she's an advocate of maternal, newborn, child, and adolescent health rights and well-being in humanitarian and fragile situations. Princess Sarah founded and led Every Woman, Every Child, Everywhere, an unprecedented global multi-stakeholder movement to integrate humanitarian and fragile settings in the renewed global strategy for women's, children's, and adolescents' health. Next to Princess Sarah, we have um, Scott Weber, who is the Director General of Interpeace. Since 2005, he's been doing that job. He provides strategic direction to the organization and oversees its operations, partnerships, and budget. In his spare time, if he has any spare time, he works with schools and universities to integrate peace education into their teaching practices and curricula. And finally, last but very much not least, we have Patrick Youssef at the far end, who is the Deputy Regional Director of the International Committee of the Red Cross, where he has been since he joined the ICRC in 2005. In his role, Mr. Yusuf Patrick manages ICRC operations in the Maghreb, the Sahal region, the Lake Chad Basin, and West Africa. So that's our, that's our team. What I'm going to do, the sort of format of this, is we've got three quarters of an hour, so what we really want to do is get maximum conversation going and participation from the audience. But just to start things off, I'm going to ask each of, each of our three panelists to just uh, give us their reflections, really, on the subject matter. Once we've done that, I might just claim chairman's rights, if that's the right expression, and ask, uh, ask a, a question or two just to start the ball rolling. But actually, in asking those questions, what we really want to do is to get a debate going, or a discussion, anyway, going. So whether it's between the panelists, um, if you don't mind, we'll let the panelists have a go at the discussion first. And if you want to sort of join in, then stick your, stick your hand up and we'll, we'll integrate you. And then once we've done that, uh, we'll throw it open to, to everybody and anybody who would like to ask a question. So without further ado, um, could I ask uh, Patrick to start the ball rolling? <coughs> Great. <coughs> so good afternoon. Thank you very much for allowing me to be part of this very interesting discussion. And I've seen throughout the time that the uh, Gubargi Foundation and this forum specifically has integrated the questions around conflict and peace more and more into the, the agenda. And I'm very pleased uh, for that. <clears throat> I'm also pleased that in the audience we have a dream team from the Club de Madrid, where we had a very interesting discussion a whole day yesterday on tackling more or less the same issues, so I'm sure that they will participate from their own, uh, from their own positions. Um, so I come from the International Committee of the Red Cross. I spent my time mostly in the field creating levers and proximity with uh, victims of war, violence, and conflicts. And we've seen, and that's not a, that's not a hidden fact, that most of the wars that we have today have been ongoing since many, many years. I've spent five years almost in Iraq, uh, where I, the first question I asked, when did this war really affect you? And the bizarre question, and that was in 2014, um, the bizarre answer was the war started in 1989 with the Iraq-Iran war, and we are still living the same effects of that war since then. Mm -hmm. What we see that a small lapse of time defines a conflict and its effects we should really dig deeper. But anyway, without going or dwelling into the history of Iraq, I've spent my time in conflicts that have emerged for at least seven to 15 years of duration. And these war have had immense effect on the population. I bear that in the room here, very few people will tell me when the war in Somalia has started and how long has it taken. So I'm just stopping at this Im Im immediate importance of the conflicts and its nature to see how peace can be part of the solution, uh, uh, sorry, uh, education part of the solution and trying to mitigate the effects of war and try to build East. So very obviously the crisis that we have in our hands are crisis with no end. 
But we shouldn't forget that the young generation living these wars have no options. The no option has been translated into action in the field. We've met with child soldiers or young, uh, a young, uh, young generation who carry weapons to, uh, in fact, enforce their presence in the society. They do so to gain credibility, to gain a role in the society, but also to be able to become a strong member of the society. I've met someone in Somalia who said, without, being, without me carrying a weapon, I wouldn't be able to get married. I'll be considered like a, a very you know, unworthy to become a major part of the society. So I think on war and peace, we can easily point out of the correlation between the duration of conflicts and the lack of access to education. And here we can give examples of South Sudan, DRC, Somalia, Afghanistan, and the list can go on and on, where alternative solutions to education were found. But this stems, in fact, from inequality, from lack of justice, injustice in societies. And this is where, in fact, the next point that I want to bring to the, to the fore is mostly on solutions, because we all know, and the obvious answer is, would education be part of finding solutions to a peace process? Sure, I mean, that's, that's the obvious answer. But I think we should pinpoint our own mistakes. The whole international community, and namely the humanitarian sector, have been looking or having a tendency to look at education like a second or third important aspect of la saving lives. What we know how to do is to bring water and food and assistance immediately. But we, I think, failed in looking at the urgency of setting education platforms uh, as valuable lev leverages to counter the effects of war and conflicts. And I think I blame it on many issues. One, our formatted minds. Maybe the media attention that is brought more to the water and famine and you know people not being able to drink and, and find water, that's, that's fine. But I also blame it on this dichotomy that we've spoken on during the World Humanitarian Summit, the dichotomy between emergency response and the development uh, activities. And here, I think, for education to be an essential part of tackling war and building peace, we should really look at it as we look at healthcare. We should really look at it as an essential part of building the victim's infrastructure for the future. And allow me for just two, three minutes to consider that, yes, education is an essential part. It's not about math. It's not about science. It's not, not about teaching skills. But it's really, and we see it in the, in the society, it's, it's about injecting values in the society. It's also about treating the wounds that I mentioned in the beginning related to why the wars have started. Meaning to tackle in our education means to insert solutions for equality, inequality, or injustice, and making sure that the responses that we have are very comprehensive. I think the last question is how. And I know from our different perspectives, from the foundations, from the uh, humanitarian organizations, from philanthropies, we really want to know how. And I think my fellow uh, panelists will definitely provide some solutions. I think as it, as it is very important to recognize that while education is extremely important, it is not a panacea to all the solutions in the society linked to violence and conflicts. You know, the reasons why we have an eruption of conflict and violence is probably rooted elsewhere. So my appeal today is to look at education in a very holistic manner and look at how we can build infrastructure for the people, bring back services, but also provide the individuals, those who really need to become part of the future leadership of a state of a country with the means to recreate social cohesion, not only in victims, with uh, conflicts, in situations of violence, but also in fragile states. And I think fragile states uh, and uh, conflicts do correlate in many of the elements that I brought in. So just zooming back to the main element that I started with, protracted conflicts 
do not stop just by injecting education, although I admit, and I think I would find a lot of enemies from, from the audience if I wouldn't, wouldn't say so, but admittedly, it's part of a bigger structure. It's part of, part of a bigger service provision to the society in order to bring social cohesion back to it. Thank you. Patrick, thank you. I mean, so much resonates there. Um, we all experience cultures right across the world where the, the carriage of weapons is the, you know, is such a sort of leap motif. And actually, whether those values you talked about being the, the, the main ingredient, really, in injecting education are, are, can be universalized, it's a, it's a very interesting question. Scott. Uh, thank, thank you, Jamie. Is this working? Um, it's always a problem to follow Patrick uh, on a panel. Uh, because uh, I'm going to touch on, uh, unsurprisingly, a number of the same issues, perhaps from a different set of experiences. So uh, Interpeace, the organization that I run, is working in 21 different conflict zones on the ground. Uh, and one of the things that I can say with confidence is that every single one of the conflicts that we deal with have at their origin some form of political, social, or economic exclusion. And the sense of injustice uh, that Patrick was alluding to, that is born out from that sense of exclusion. Now, that will take me, and uh, I'll, I'll come back to this later on in, in this presentation, that the solution is inclusion, and, and strategies of inclusion, and education has a key role to play in making that real in society. But I want to take a moment and talk about, uh, and refer, in fact, to a speech that Kofi Annan gave a few years ago at the Munich Security Conference where he was talking about the Middle East and why it was unraveling, essentially. And what he said actually is relevant for the wider global picture. He said that the reason why we feel like we're on such shaky ground today is that it's clear, it's become abundantly clear to all of us, that the old system no longer works. And yet we don't have the new system. We are caught in between. It's our generation's responsibility to create that new system. And that is true both at the macro level and at the micro level. And I'll, I'll touch on that. Our social contract globally is broken, isn't working. Um, I would argue that the SDGs are the world's first attempt to try to draft uh, a set of global social contract terms. But their implementation is still far, far, far from reality. Um, but the social contract also in countries is broken. Our systems are leaving too many people behind, even in our developed countries. We had the very strange phenomenon of what happened in the elections in the U.S. Years, is that for the first time in a long time, the majority in the U.S. felt excluded, too, from their own country, oddly enough. But that was their feeling. So when we think of exclusion, we think minorities feel excluded, etc. Often it's majorities feel excluded, too. And that brings populism and it brings many of the things that the previous panel was talking about in this room. So the social contract is clearly, no matter which political bent you have, making you feel excluded. And so our challenge is to think up better social systems, better political systems, in order to create more inclusive societies. That's the challenge of our generation. How are we going to create more inclusive societies? Uh, and that's why a lot of the focus of Interpeace, actually, even though we're a a peace building organization working on peace processes, reconciliation, constitution making and things like that, at the, at the core of it is really about how we're going to help build a social contract for all. And I say for all because sometimes there's a social contract for some, but not for everyone. Let's be honest. When I travel around the world and go to conflict countries, everyone, no matter how nasty they are, wants peace. <laughs> they all tell me they want peace. Of course they want peace. But what they mean is their peace, and their peace generally excludes you. And so we have to be very careful about the grand ideas and concepts and terms that we're using. In reality, do, feel pe do people feel like they have a place in society? And I think that the, the, the sec section of society that is possibly most excluded are youth. They make up, in most of the countries we work in, 60, sometimes 70% of the population yet completely excluded from any formal economy, excluded from, obviously, decision-making in government and politics. And, and that's ludicrous. We're, it's, a, it's a time bomb. And yet, we haven't found social political systems 
including in developed countries. I think Brexit's vote would have been quite different had 16-year-olds been allowed to vote, for example. Uh, we are not finding the right political systems to create legitimacy and acceptance in our society and a sense of, of belonging. And this is our, our, our greatest challenge. Now, the reality is that never before has the local been as global, uh, but the inverse too. So local being global is that you can have young people feel excluded in El Salvador. Uh, they join youth gangs. We work with the Maras in, in, in Central America, for example. They join youth gangs. Youth gangs become the way that they feel a sense of belonging and power and social trajectory. It becomes super dangerous. and That causes people to flow across borders into the US and refugees. I mean, it, the local is global. What people feel locally is creating global phenomena. Um, and every region of the world can cite a recent example of that. But the global is also local. So we're seeing that young people that we work with in Abidjan, in the youth gangs, the, the what they, what they call the microbe in, 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 uh, in West Africa, uh, they see how other people live in, in yeah. France and Europe. Their dream is not to get a job in Côte d'Ivoire. Their dream is to get to Paris. Because now on Facebook, they see what, it, what it's like to live in Paris. And so the migration flows. Côte d'Ivoire is the country that sends the most migrants to, to Europe right now of any country in West Africa. It's not in conflict. I mean, it has conflict issues, but it's not, it's not like uh, Mali. Yet it's sent big, why? Because people see the global reality and they want that too. And that's driving them towards those goals. Now, what is, to come to, like Patrick said, to what are some solutions to this type of situation? We have to look at, uh, at, at this social contract, making it real for all. What's at the core of that is trust. Trust in society, trust uh, horizontally between groups in society and that's about inclusion, that's about feeling that you you don't have to look over your shoulder because your neighbor might want to take your land, et cetera. And, so, and, and vertical trust between the people and their governments. That's the relationship that's all, often most broken and most difficult to actually rebuild. But we have to be looking at, those are the litmus test of the good social contract. So those relationship issues between people in society and between them and their authorities and government. Education has a key role to play in all this. We are not actually preparing the citizenry to know how to live together. We're not teaching them skills of living together, vivre ensemble, as we say in French. Uh, we are not focusing on a core aspect of the violence phenomenon that we're dealing with, which is masculinity. We do a, there's a lot of work being done by many great organizations on, on women's uh, protecting girls and girls' education and women's inclusion. We do a lot of work in that direction too, but there's not enough focus actually on the toxic masculinity in society the notions of masculinity that, 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 that actually feed violence. And this is something we have to actually focus on. And education has a role to play. Knowing how to solve problems together and stop promoting you know, systems of problem solving that are just about the individual, the strong man. Look, when you go to most of the cities that we all work in, do you ever have a, 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 a statue to a committee? No, it's always to an individual. We're promoting through that type of education too, through the symbols of our society, that one person is the person who makes the difference. No, that person didn't do anything without a group of people. We have to promote more emotional intelligence uh, and those types of soft skills, non-cognitive skills, <coughs> through education. That's formal education. The problem is that most kids are not in school. And war is school. Violence is a teacher. War is school and violence is a teacher. 22 million young people in the MENA region, according to UNICEF, are out of school or likely to drop out of school. Okay, but that doesn't mean they're not learning. They are. They're learning a lot right now. And that whole generation is going to become the adults that we're dealing with in the future. So education is key, formal, and working on the family's role and the community's role in promoting the right values of social cohesion and the things that, that we've been talking about so far. Thank you. Scott, thank you very much. I mean, a couple of uh, just, just observations, I suppose. I mean, one is uh, where, where in all this does social media sit as a s part of the solution? Um, I'm doing a bit of work with Chatham House at the moment about uh, European democracy and trying to, uh, if you like, take a sort of a sum negative, as it's perceived at the moment, about how social media is, has interacted with populism and turned it into a, um, to a benefit, actually, which can restore the democratic ideal in, in European democracies. It's the, same, it's the same sort of issue, using that as 
harnessing that power to actually educate if in the absence of formal education rather than it being the other way around. Um, and my, my sort of uh, earlier life in, in Northern Ireland and places, I mean, it staggers me going back to your point about where does conflict begin and where does it end. Uh, nowadays in Northern Ireland, thank God it's peaceful, more peaceful than when I was last there. But uh, everybody goes to school in different schools, depending on what religion you are still. Uh, and that, that the solution to the conflict there is not going to change until that changes. I mean, it's just a fact. Sorry, I shouldn't be talking. But Princess. I had a long flight to get here. I came from New York, so I'm afraid I, I sat and I spent my time <laughs> writing, so I apologize if I um, am going to, to uh, read from my text. First of all, thank you so much for, uh, for including me on this um, panel so that we could discuss this very important topic. Uh, forgive me if what I say has already been covered um, by my colleagues. No matter what we know of human progress and development, with so much turbulence, extremism of every shade, crushing poverty, inequality, and unchecked climate change, there is sadly little to be optimistic about. And although there is progress, it is not fast enough nor far enough to avoid being overwhelmed by the more powerful forces of global insecurity. There is no single reason for this toxic spread of disaster. Instead, there is a complex, tangled web of ungoverned spaces driven by a variety of combinations of poverty and underdevelopment, food insecurity, environmental degradation, inequality and persecution, further complicated by politics, history, and national <coughs> self-interest of the narrowest kind. Knowing this, that the problems are complex and the causes multifold and interlocking, why do we continue to try and solve them so simplistically? We have, for example, divided up a woman and all she cares about into a multitude of segments and divvied up responsibility of each to different and competing groups. Her stomach has gone to WFP, her ovaries to UNFPA, children to UNICEF, employment and voice to UN Women, vaccines to Gavi, and her crops and animals to FAO. In every sector and in every setting, we must focus on and for the entirety of women's bodies and needs. We must support and enable an environment that embraces and fulfills her, my, head, heart, hand, and health, and all at the same time. If not, we will continue to negate the positive impacts of all other interventions and support, condemning the world's most vulnerable to a continual cycle, a continual cycle of dependency, failure, and frustration, which will last for generations, moving us deeper into the embrace of war, not peace, growth, prosperity, and decency. As the cornerstone of the hand, heart, and uh, head, heart, and hand transformation needed, I am going to focus largely on health, especially for women and girls. For women and girls, malnutrition can have catastrophic effects because it impairs physical and cognitive development and limits their ability to grow, learn, earn, contribute, and lead. When pregnant and lactating mothers are malnourished, the transcending effects on future generations can be irreversible. Proper nutrition in the first 1,000 days of life, from conception to a child's second birthday, provides the essential building blocks for brain development, healthy growth, and a strong immune system. Without it, resulting damage to a child's neurological and physical development leads to diminished capacity to learn, poorer performance at school, greater susceptibility to disease, and a lifetime of lost earning potential. Additionally, a mother's poor nutrition before and during pregnancy results in increased risk of preterm birth. Premature babies are more likely to suffer from acute and chronic medical conditions, nutritional deficiencies, vision and hearing deficiencies, cognitive and speech delays, behavioral problems and learning disabilities, depression, anxiety, attention deficit disorder, and more, all again hindering optimal development and progress through childhood and ultimately as pr productive adults. 155 million children under five are stunted by lack of nutrients, almost 75% living in countries affected by conflict. This stunting will have potentially lifelong impact on their physical and cognitive development, 
which has ripple effects, not only affecting their future, but the future of families, communities, and countries. Beyond the individual tragedy of lives curtailed, investments being made in every sector are underpowered and undermined. In disease control and elimination, where 30% of tuberculosis cases have malnutrition as the underlying cause, and where malnourished children are twice as likely to die from malaria and nine times more likely to die from pneumonia than those with good nutrition. In economic development, where half the, country, half the children of a country will be unable to participate in the modern economy. In peace and security and in education, when children are cognitively damaged or suffer from toxic stress as a result of childhood trauma, all before they even have the chance to sit before a teacher. Where is the peace, reconciliation, reconstruction, productive mental participation from millions of people who are diminished from the outset? Now briefly, to head, heart, and hand. You've heard many times already today, but it needs to be repeated. The nature of work we will do in the very near future is going to be radically different. Technology brings with it extraordinary access and new threats. States, ideas, industries will go out of business. Two thirds of young people will work in jobs that do not yet exist. And one third of the skills needed, even by 2020, are not currently prioritized. States con state controlled education systems too often merely serve to reinforce existing, existing hierarchies rather than to help young people build networks of global citizens. National curriculums prioritize teaching of conflicts won, defeats never entirely forgotten, and atrocities somehow justified. Explore into political and social systems for coexistence and peace, international law, and human rights and ensure that learners have an understanding of the planet, its fragility, and mankind's relationship with it. Instead, most children in the world are taught in factory schools, churning out pupils, with an emphasis on curiosity, grit, leadership, initiatives, abilities, and social and cultural awareness nowhere in sight. Nor is creativity and the ability to perceive the world and reality in new and innovative ways to find hidden patterns, to make connections between seemingly unrelated phenomena and to generate solutions. In other words, to dream. To dream that we can do something different than we are at the moment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think, um, oh my goodness, a lot came out of that. Um, <laughs> I mean, this, this idea of displacement and, and uh, and children's health uh, really having a, an effect not just on the individual but on community and, and society as a whole is, a, is, a, is an extremely powerful theme in what you're saying. And also the point you make about even when people are in education, making sure that the education is something which, which is flexible and can, can be adapted to the individual but also to the requirements of society. Um, right. Let's go. I'm going to ask uh, Yusuf, if I may, to, to lead off on a, 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 a Patrick, uh, if I may, to lead off on a question, uh, really just to get us all going. I'm changing, being flexible, I'm changing my plan as we go along. I'm not going to ask everybody a question because I'm desperate for all the people who know more about it than I do to ask the question. So I'm going to just, just have one question rather than three. And to Patrick, really, the question is, um, you know, what interests me is to what degree is, is um, national education uh, a microcosm and led by and dictated by the situation in society, in their particular society? And therefore, can you isolate education in terms of the values you're talking about from a conflict environment? Or are we always going to have the Roman Catholics in Northern Ireland educating their children in one way, and the Protestants in Northern Ireland doing it in another way ad infinitum. Are we able to sort of isolate, if you like, those values to a, to a, to a usable degree for us to be able to educate people away from war and into peace? <clears throat> I, think the, um, I think the answer should be twofold. The first one, um, the first one is the implementation of solutions in normal societies in societies that are not affected by wars. Because I, I really believe that 
There is a huge lack of, of trust in the system. There is a, because of the war and conflict, there is a question of trust in whoever deals with the, um, with, with the life quality of people living under these conditions. Who, in fact, and we all know it, if ever one of you worked in a conflict setting, public property doesn't mean anything for the people. Uh, everyone wants his own water. Everyone wants his own medicine. We, there's no trust in the public sector, and including in the hospitals, who in the most radical cases are being used as military caserns, if not completely dysfunctional, and in other cases are used as madrasas, with all my respect to the madrasas, but also probably used as a mean to instigate for more violence or learn the techniques in a relatively different way. So I think if we go back to the question of, of the outlook and how we need to bridge that gap in, in societies, we need to do everything, all the humanitarian responses that we need to do should include a big part of digni dignity in them. What the ICRC looks at in the first phase of, a, of an emergency is to provide life-saving operations as quick as possible. But in parallel, try to start building solutions to provide people for the means to build their own livelihood yeah. and not become dependent yeah. on humanitarian aid. Mm -hmm. And where we feel there is a big part of education in it is in the way these programs are integrated in the society mm -hmm. with the victims and the training that comes with it. You may say that this is done on a very short scale, and a very small scale. It's true. But this, in fact, is a learn in progress. The Red Cross specifically works with 199 national societies in the world. The ICRC works with the American Red Cross, with the Nigerian Red Cross, with the French Red Cross, with, with the largest network of volunteers in the world who slowly but surely get the essence of our projects and where we want to inject education as much as possible in every project. So I think a more holistic and comprehensive yeah. approach could, in fact, make a change in people's lives, especially those affected by wars. That, that's um, a fascinating answer. And, it, and actually underlying all of that and lurking in there is this function of leadership, which we don't sort of uh, we don't sort of necessarily state openly, but the conduit of education getting into the community has got to be local leadership uh, prepared to do it, absolutely. Scott, would you like to just reflect? Yeah, if I can just jump in on this one, because um, I think we put too much responsibility in education to be the answer. It's part of the answer, for sure. Mm -hmm. But it's not, it's, it, we are, we're expecting too much from it in a society that's not willing to look at its own demons. Mm -hmm. You know, I was in Belfast actually, what, three, four days ago. Uh, my vice chairwoman is Monica McWilliams, who was on the, mm -hmm. the only woman on the, at the negotiating mm -hmm. table. And she's very, she, and we are all very worried about what Brexit's going to do to the Good Friday Agreement um, or, uh, and to, as we approach the 20th anniversary on it, April 10th. No one wants to celebrate uh, that agreement because of what's going on now. But, you know, I'll give a little anecdote. When we first started working in Rwanda, we recognized and we were trying to help the Rwandans actually go through a dialogue about their future. They said, we can't do that until we actually deal with our past. Yeah. This is what the Rwandans saying that. They, we have to deal with our past. They stopped teaching history after the genocide uh, because they didn't know what version of history to teach. Every textbook that had been written had been written by previous regimes to advance their particular yeah. political slant on the situation. And so they couldn't use all the material they had. The teachers had been trained to advance those ideologies. So they said, OK, until we figure this out, we're going to stop teaching it. So we actually had to help the Rwandans at a social political level, getting professors and old people who had been in the royal court and, and, and people from the communities and canvassing the country just to get them to talk and have a cathartic moment about their own history to then be able to possibly write a curriculum book, which they did, then did, that now they teach. And they feel that it's, it doesn't hide their, their, yeah. their bad parts. It actually exposes them, but in a way that they can be discussed. Great. Not taking one side or another, but 
It actually becomes a point of discussion. That's part of it. But the society had to do that first. Yeah. And so we can't put education as the answer. Oh, if we just put a little bit more education, it's going to help them overcome that. No, they have to deal with that issue mm -hmm. at a societal level. In Lebanon, I, I point at Patrick, who, who uh, has Lebanese roots too. In Lebanon, I was shocked when I was uh, seeking to work there that the history is, is taboo in Lebanon. You can't talk about history, let alone teach it. And then you expect education to be the answer. No, we have to deal with this, everyone, mm -hmm. at a societal level. And that takes leadership, indeed. It takes social movements uh, or, you know, to seek to bring people together to overcome their differences. It doesn't mean we need to paper over or find the lowest common denominator. That's also not a solution. But, but have the society go through its social transformation process and then have the education system boost and reflect that, not the other way around. Yeah. Thank you very much. Princess, do you want to add anything on that? On that uh, I'm scribbling away. <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, Simon Sharma mm. also referred to this um, uh, quite beautifully this morning about the importance of, of history. Um, uh, just in, in agreement again, um, uh, a negotiated peace also um, puts, either keeps someone in power or it replaces the group that was in power with the victors, the, the rebel victors. And when you, the leadership that you need is not that, is not um, a group that turns inward, that is by nature secretive, that is destructive as opposed to constructive. Um, and that is what we see in conflict. These are not the right traits that should then be moving forward a society towards peaceful coexistence, uh, tolerance, um, promotion of, uh, of history, really understanding, um, uh, not denying, not trying to exclude, and so on. Um, so from, from the very top all the way through, uh, the, the issues that surround um, yeah. peace as well have to be examined. Thank you. Very, very, very useful. Um, what we're going to do here is, if if um, if you could just put your hand up, and then if I po <laughs> uh, if I point to you, then if you could just say who you are very quickly, and what, are, what if could you ask one of the panelists um, your question, and then what I quite like you to do is to have a bit of an exchange with the panelist and anybody who wants to talk out there, because I want maximum participation from out there, as it were. Let's start with the lady over here. First, I apologize because I came late, because I was at a different session, but I couldn't miss this. My name is Masa Mufti, I'm Syrian, and I work with Syrian refugees on education. And my question with regards to this, the topic of this panel is the following. The three pillars of UN are interconnected, human rights, development, and peace. In other words, there's no such a thing that we can reach peace without having human rights and development as well. So in the context of war, and I would like to mention specifically the context of the Syrian crisis and the war there, how can we really talk about peace and the role of education in uh, enforcing or helping peace happening if human rights are not even tackled and there's no such accountability addressing human rights? And when development is completely marginalized because there's solely or restricted to humanitarian and aid approach. So forget about development. Mm. So and yet, we want to address peace at this point. So peace cannot happen, with, happen within people without a sense of trust and justice. And it does not happen either without bringing hope and really making people believe that there is something beyond that catastrophe, which is development. Yeah. So my question really is, and yet, sorry, <laughs> when we talk about international organization and everyone, yet when they approach people like ourselves, they are very keen on supporting programs that work on building the resilience. You know, resilience is very key word in that jargon. Yeah. How can we, what is resilience is about? Who am I, who are we to teach people and to tell them what resilience is about 
when they have been suffering and struggling all these years, seven years now in the, in the Syrian context, and they are surviving, they're the ones who can teach us what resilience is about. So peace has criteria and conditions. My questions to the panelists is how can we really approach peace from this perspective? Development, human rights to make true peace happen. Scott, would you like to um, start on that one? It, it, do you want to take a few, or do you want to? No, no. I'd, I'd like to, if, if you if you'd respond to that one, and, and if we can keep the responses tight, which they yep. they have been to date, that'd be great. Thank you very much, and, and and I agree. These are these are the three big pillars. I mean, one can add others, but these are the three big pillars. I I think when we think about peace building, even the definition of peace building is important to distinguish because. The definition of peace building is not to do away with conflict. The conflict is actually natural in society. The, the, the difficulty and the confrontation of ideas and agendas. What we're trying to do in peace building is not to do away with that, because we need that for society to move forward. What we're trying to do in peace building is to build, is to strengthen the capacities of a society to manage those conflicts nonviolently. We do that in functional societies. That happens through the police or the courts or the parliament or through various things. Confrontations happen, but you know policies advance, etc. In our societies, where people don't trust the institutions or they're weak or, or non-existent, those are manifested through violence. People advance their interests through violence. So when when you talk about the three pillars, yes, they're the right three pillars. The problem is our capacity to protect human rights is weak. Our our, our capacity to protect uh, uh, good governance are weak and hold people accountable. That's weak. It's not that you don't have governance. You do. It's just bad governance, right? You, you, it's not that uh, people don't know the human rights principles. It's that no one's watching. And look, now with some countries, and including in the, in the P5 countries of the Security Council, who no longer spend as much time working on what uh, the princess's uh, uh, amazing husband uh, and colleague is doing uh, as High Commissioner for Human Rights, the, even in the Security Council, they're not respecting human rights. Then who's watching? Who's keeping everyone to account? So if we don't have systems that protect these things, then they start to deteriorate. And I think we focus too much on maybe getting more advocacy for something rather than looking at what is a system that's broken down to protect them. So when we're trying to build peace, we're actually looking at capacities to, to maintain uh, the ability to have conflict but do it nonviolently. And in Syria, we're, there's going to be a long road to rebuilding Syria, of course. But for me, what, what were the signposts that were missed? There were, there were things that were, the, the capacities were not there to protect these principles in Syria. And it broke down when there was too much stress on the, on the system. Thank you. That, that's great. Uh, if we could have a gentleman from the Western Isles here. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Tari Kelly from Sunny Scotland. Um, Surely education is never going to bring about peace. War is just far too much big business. It makes so much money for not only private companies around the world, but it's also for the governments as well, because a lot of these governments have uh, electoral rights to, their, to the people to continue with their jobs and such things. I mean, the UK is now in the process of negotiating an agreement with the Saudi government for, uh, I think it's 48 time frame jets. Turn around and say, well, we're going to educate people and we're going to get away with war. There's going to be so many thousands of people who are going to, are going to lose their jobs in the UK and they'll vote them out of the government. So, surely, education is it's all fine, it's a noble cause, but the, the, the fact that is, war is a big business, and it's not only big business for these com companies, it's big business for governments as well. Mm -hmm. So, it's going to be you're, you're fighting an uphill battle. So many people will get, take, take, on, take on education, such things as for peace, but there's so many other people in the background who want to continue making weapons, continue to make bullets, and there'll always be someone out there who'll be a buyer. Tariq, have you got a specific question you want to ask, or, or just to yeah, how, 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 how do you, how, when, for like uh, uh, Patrick, how, do you, how, how is it dealing with governments when, when they've got a right to look after their sort of uh, people, <coughs> and such things? How do you find it when you're talking to these governments and talking, and yet you know some of these governments are doing big military deals. Yeah, so, <clears throat> so a big part of my answer would be 
to look at uh, education in a very large lens. It is not about a school teacher and a student. It's about incorporating education and again the, the means to inject answers to inequality or injustice in mostly everything we do. So the International Committee of the Red Cross visits places of detention, visits the Boko Haram detainees, visits Al-Qaeda. I myself went three times to Guantanamo. And the education starts within, even during these visits. It's about building peace during wartime. It is not a process that takes, takes uh, place just after the end of hostilities. So I think the I think it's an extremely complex process to understand, unless we take education from a school perspective, a school, a student, mm -hmm. and a teacher. But that's not, we all know that's not the answer. Um, so I think there's a big part on advocacy, a lot on what Interpeace does with states, a lot on what our president tries to do in his humanitarian diplomacy um, that can bring positive results. But there's also a lot that we can do, and that is not linked to the war industry and the bright colors that I mentioned in my, in my presentation. A lot has, been, has to be done with non-state armed groups, with okay. rebel groups, with those who are today completely stigmatized by the word terrorism, mm -hmm. when in most cases there are people fighting because of inequality. A lot of you probably will understand because you come from an education uh, board, but at the General Assembly, we would definitely be booed at the end of a speech that would incorporate solutions for non-state armed groups. Mm -hmm. Because non-state armed groups are dealing and have an authority over people and students alike. So and that's where the Red Cross, for example, had a very successful attempt to bring 82 of the Chibok girls back to their families, and on both ends, on the families and the school, on the government of Nigeria, but also on Boko Haram, or the Islamic State in the Western Africa province, this talked to their humanity and their sense of bringing back a positive solution to society. Otherwise, they wouldn't have, you know, they wouldn't have released them. We did the same recently with 10 engineers and three professors, and that wasn't the same the same line of action, the same uh, effort to bring more and more visibility to finding solutions for the future. One of which, as Scott said, is the pure sense of, edu uh, the, uh, sorry, the sense of, uh, strict sense of, def uh, of education as we normally uh, see it. So I think, maybe I didn't answer directly your question, but I just wanted to put a broader sense of um, assistance uh, and education and development building in the response and not only building solutions that would just definitely not, in my, again, field-driven position will not answer the question and will put us in these cycles of violence that we saw in Iraq in 2014 with the Islamic State creation. And I would argue that the non-state armed groups today are very intelligent, very smart, very well organized. Um, so. You know, we have to really define what education in the prism of conflicts and war should look like. I just, um, just, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm terribly sorry. We, we, we've run out. I'd love to go on for about three hours to, on this, but we, we can't. Just one anecdotally, I, I've spent a lot of the last sort of 10 or 15 years with the Halo Trust, um, which is a mine, mine clearance organization, humanitarian mine clearance. And that was all fine, and everybody accepted us doing mine clearance. The moment we started destroying weapons, it kicks into exactly what you, you say. We became very, very unpopular in the areas in which we were destroying weaponry. I'm talking about small arms, taking them out of the system. And if we did destroy them, we lost the, we lost the confidence of that local male population very often. And secondly, within two weeks, they had new, uh, I mean, new weapons to replace them, not second-hand weapons, new weapons, which is quite an interesting little sort of point. Of, sorry, Scott. You, um, I think we have to recognize that governments don't build peace. People build peace. And even the United Nations in its charter, it's we the peoples of the United Nations. It's not we the nation states of the, of the United Nations. It's the peoples. We have to remember that, is that the people need to drag their governments towards peace. Mm -hmm. But if they're not educated to recognize that 
you know, sending in an F-16 is, is, is not the better way to resolve that problem, if they don't demand that their governments first uh, look at the, f the following nine options before they turn to that and hold them accountable for that, the systems that are not there that I was talking about, then we're going to be stuck in this, in this uh, kleptocracy of uh, an arms industry that buys votes that then buy. So I agree with you. It's a powerful, powerful industry and tool and influence. But the only bulwark against that, to come back to your point, Jamie, also about social media, on fake news, et cetera, the only, I, I believe the only bulwark to that is people's own sense of scrutiny of what they're looking at. And that's their ability to be curious, intelligent discerners of the nonsense versus the, the quality information and start gravitating towards quality information. You can't stop the information. And the issue about arms industry is that people need to demand that their governments first look at the first nine options first, and once those are eliminated, then turn to, to, to hard security solutions. But they're not educated to do that. A small, silly example, silly example in terms of my own organization. The amount of scrutiny that we have in order to defend why our theory of change about getting people to work together towards a common solution is better value for money, to use your government's term, than other alternatives, which is to send the the, the F-16s in, is crazy. It's crazy. We need to go, we need to stop being on the defensive and go on the offensive mm -hmm. in the peace field. We need to put the arms industry on the back foot, having to defend to the public why that's a better use of resources. Because okay. they can't. I'm going to have to jump in there. I'm sorry, I've been a hopeless moderator because I wanted to involve everybody. I'm I can't take any more questions because we run out of time. If we could bid for another two hours next time round, it would be great. But thank you so much to the fascinating um, committee here. Um, really great. Patrick, Scott, Princess, fantastic. Thank you. Thank you.